Better, better and better, 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 better,
Uh, do you have all kinds of anxieties? You're, you have mind racing thoughts going on that whirl around in your mind. Your mind is what Satan is trying to steal. He's after your mind. If he can win your mind, he will win the battle. So why do you think that there are mind-altering substances? Why do you think? Why do you think there's mind-altering substances? Because Satan wants your mind. If he can win your mind, ladies and gentlemen, he can put strings around your hands and strings around your your feet and he will work you like a puppet now he has control over you now i want you to listen to me and i want you to pay attention this word today could be one of the best words that you have ever heard in your life say and that's why there's so many people that are not here today i have been working on this message for two weeks I have struggled with it, and God has given me a word for you today, and I want you to hear me, what I am saying. <coughs> Satan will come right now today immediately to steal the word. He doesn't want you to hear it. He will steal it right out of your heart. Right during this message today, he is going to bring disturbance to your mind. He is going to try to get <coughs> you out of focus today. When you hear the word, he's going to bring confusion to you today. He doesn't want the word that I'm going to share with you to be planted and rooted in your heart. Now, you can't let that happen. You need to pay attention. You need to focus on what I'm saying because this word will save your life. So, get focused and do not listen to the enemy. In 2 Corinthians verse 10, 3-5, and this is why I say everybody should be taking notes because you will not remember this and you need to. It says this, For though we walk in the flesh, now listen, our flesh is what? Our flesh is our bodies, right? It says even though we walk in the flesh, we're human beings, we are not carrying out our warfare according to the flesh and we're not using mere human weapons. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about strongholds. What's a stronghold? <coughs> what is a stronghold? Anybody remember? It's something, it's a strong hold over your life. <coughs> Are you, a, are you a habitual liar? That's a stronghold. Do you like to watch pornography? That's a stronghold. Are you constantly consumed with anger and rage? That's a stronghold. So it's saying here, we have the ability to overflow strongholds. Verse 5, inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. How many of how many times do we do that? We go, ah, that's not true. Ugh, that's not right. So and so said it this way. You know, uh, pastors can say things a hundred different ways, and then we choose which way we're going to believe. What difference does it make? Dare to just believe. We argue. And what does Satan do? He gets us in controversies. He wants us to argue. He wants us to be upset. Oh, my mother did that to me, and my dad did this, and so-and-so called me a name. Ladies and gentlemen, if we get in an uproar over every time that somebody says something to us, I would be upset constantly every single day. I have many, many critics uh, that come after me. It's not worth it. So it says here uh, that it sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Satan doesn't want you to even know who God is. And we lead every thought, every thought and purpose away, captive into the obedience of Christ. He's wanting us to take captive our thoughts. Now listen, most believers, Christians, they can be Catholics, they can be Baptists, they can be Lutherans. They can be non-denominational people. 
Most believers, that's you and that's me, I hope you're a believer today, but most believers are not free indeed. They are not. Now what's the problem? They don't believe that they can be under bondage of the enemy who is called Satan, the devil. They do not believe that. If you want to be free indeed, you must forget your past and stop looking in the rear view mirror. You need to stop looking at where you have been and start looking at where you're going to go. Move on. Move on. We've all had problems. We all have a past. We can all list 110, 150, 1,289 problems that we have had in our past. Every single person in this room has had something bad happen to them. And I'm telling you today, move on. Get over it. Your past is going to keep you stuck in the mud. One of the most famous classical pianists of our time had a piano teacher when he was a teenager tell him, you're wasting your time. Your fingers are too stubby to play the piano. You will never make it. And instead of those hurtful words discouraging him, they lit a fire of encouragement under him and he started to focus his mind on playing the piano. He imagined with his mind that he could play anything. And he became one of the most world-renowned classical pianists of our time. Now there was another example of a golfer who was a professional golfer, led the leader charts many times, I forget his name, but he got sick and he ended up in the hospital. And they told him, you will never play golf again. That was his profession. That was his career. And he, be, he started to believe that he would never play golf again. He had some rare disease that really kept him bedridden. And so what he did, he was in the hospital for weeks at a time. And when he laid in his bed, through his imagination, he would play golf course after golf course, 18 holes in South Carolina, 18 holes in California, 18 holes in Colorado, and he was playing hole by hole by hole, and when he got out of the hospital, it was like he had never stopped playing golf. He played it again because why? He used his mind to move his life forward. And you and I could do the same thing. What, what is your mind set on today? What are you thinking about today? Your mind is going to move your life forward or your mind is going to move your life backward. Your mind is going to keep you stuck in the mud or your mind is going to move you into greatness. Your mind will heal your body or it will keep it sick. What you say out of your mouth will seal the deal. It will seal your fate. If you, now listen to me, if you constantly criticize yourself, your fate will begin to be sealed with what you're saying. You will start believing your own words. If you speak positive things over your life even though you don't believe them, pretty soon you're going to believe that. But if you are constantly criticizing yourself, you're going to be in trouble. The Bible says this. It says, call things that are not as though they were. If what you want you to draw to you, what you say about yourself is extremely, and I'm underlining the word extremely important. If you criticize who you are, that is nothing but false pride, and it will get you in trouble. It's, here's what it's like. It's saying that God doesn't know what he's doing. You're constantly putting yourself down. You're not good enough. You're stupid. And you're thinking that. You're thinking these thoughts over your life, and then you speak those words out of your mouth. You're sealing the deal. You're telling God that he didn't know what he is doing when he created you. You are telling the Father of the Most High God that he does not know who you are and that he's created a failure. And I'll tell you right now, my God in heaven doesn't create failures. He doesn't create failures. 
You need to be careful what you're speaking over your life. What are you professing over your life today? If you can profess good things or bad things. What are you professing over your children today? You can profess good things or you can profess bad things. Satan is listening. You need to be careful. Satan, uh, when you talk bad things over yourself, you criticize yourself, it's called false pride. False pride. And Satan was kicked out of heaven for having a spirit of pride. When Satan was created, he was an angel of light. He was made up of musical instruments. He was the musical uh, person that God created. And he became full of pride, and he thought he was God. And as soon as that happened, God cast him out of heaven with one-third of the angels. Now, one-third of the, two-thirds of the angels are still here. That means we have twice as many to help us than what were cast out of heaven. I'm telling you, pride is misunderstood. Most people go, oh, they're just being prideful. And they think that pride means that that person thinks they're better than everybody else. That's one definition. But it can also be the opposite extreme where you're constantly putting yourself down. And that, too, is pride. And we must not do that. You must not profess over yourself that you're stupid. If you want to lose weight, you don't go by the mirror and go, Oh my God, look at how fat I am. I'll never lose weight. Listen to me. You're professing that over yourself. If you want to lose weight, go up to the mirror and go, God, I look good today. And thank you, Father, that I'm losing weight. Call things that are not as though they were. Stop talking that negative, stupid stuff over yourself because it's going to get you in trouble. When you continually talk bad, you're just continually telling the Father in Heaven that created you that He made a failure. So when I was about 23 or 24 years old, I was the most pitiful human being you've ever seen. I was pitiful. I've told you that before. I needed attention. I had two small children at home. My marriage wasn't good. And believe me, I needed some attention. And so I would sit around the house and feel sorry for myself with two little kids. And I'd have a big old pity party. And my pity parties would make the a gala at the White House look like a small-time affair. I, when I did a pity party, I believe, believe me, I could really feel sorry for myself. And I did. And I will tell you right now, that I literally made myself sick. I literally made myself sick because I was at home with two small children feeling sorry for Mary. I got so sick that I would have dizzy spells and I could reach up into a cupboard to get a cup and I would get so dizzy that I, I almost passed out. I tell my husband about it. Of course, I just wanted attention from him because he rarely did that. I told my mother about it. She was always good to confirm all the bad things in my life. And so she would always confirm and help me worry about this dizzy spell. It got so bad, I ended up in the hospital. Doctors did all kinds of tests, and guess what? They couldn't find a thing wrong. Surprise, surprise. So I went out to see you medical centers, visited a neurologist, they did a CAT scan. He thought he saw some little thing up there in my brain, which probably he didn't, but anyway, I had an answer for my dizzy spells. All of a sudden, I got better. I made it that way. I made it that way. I was a weak, pitiful little girl that needed attention from her husband and her mother, and I literally made myself sick. So I know what this is all about. Satan used my mind to try to destroy me so that I would not fulfill the destiny that God planted in my heart. John 9 says this. Jesus is talking to us. He said, I am the door. If anyone, anyone, anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out of fine pastures. Now listen, he says, Jesus is telling us, the thief comes.
to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And isn't that what Jesus did? He laid down his life for us. So, I want you to really pay attention to what I'm going to say. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. What are you thinking about today? So, your thoughts, listen to me, your thoughts control your mouth. Your words. Your thoughts control your words. Your words control your actions. Your actions control your conduct. And your conduct controls your destiny. What do you want in your destiny? Did you all get that? Your thoughts control your words. Your words control your actions. Your actions control your conduct, how you behave, how you act. And your conduct will control your destiny. The destiny even of your soul. Paul said this, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, God. And that's what we should be speaking over our lives every day because Jesus came. Jesus came to set us free. You can be free indeed. You have one single choice. Do you want to know what it is? One single choice. It will determine your success, the happiness of your children, the destiny of your soul. It will even determine your stress factor. The single choice is how you determine to react to your past and how you determine to react to today. We all have stuff happen in our life. We all do. I have, I have so many choices I have to make on a daily basis that would make your head spin. We, have, we can choose the right way. We can choose the happy way. We don't have to choose the other way. There was a Jewish doctor by the name of Dr. Frankel, and he endured the Holocaust. The Germans killed his little children and his wife right in front of his eyes. They took him off to the camp, and they starved him practically to death. They cut off his hair. They humiliated him constantly, and he endured this torturous ordeal. When the Holocaust was over, Dr. Frankel was not seated with bitterness or anger, or he wasn't broken. And when they asked him, how did you do that? How did you come out with such a positive attitude after the torturous stuff that they did to you? And he said, everything can be taken away from a man but one thing, and that is choice. He said, I had the ability to choose my response about what was happening to me. That's what we need to do. Attitude is just an inward feeling making manifest your outward behavior. When you, when you see somebody with a frown on their face and walk up to them, it's in the atmosphere. You can feel that. You can walk into a room where somebody's been arguing and when you walk in the room, even though they've stopped arguing, you can feel the air is thick. It gets into the atmosphere. Attitude will affect you. Your attitude will affect your children. If you mope around the house all day, your children are going to have a bad attitude. It affects us. There was a father and a six-year-old son sitting at the dinner table eating dinner, and the father looked at the six-year-old son and he said, you're just eating like a pig. And the, the father then realized that they, the boy had been raised in the city and he goes, well, he may not even know what a pig is. And so he looked at him and he said, son, do you know what a pig is? And he said, well, of course, dad, that's the son of a hog. <laughs> don't ask a child a question if you don't want an honest answer attitude will affect your marriage it will affect your marriage if you get up in the morning and you're in a bad mood your attitude is going to affect your husband's attitude it can make a marriage or it can break a marriage We're, listen to me we are all madly in love when we first get married we can't wait to see each other. We're excited. 
We go out on dates. We're, we're happy people. And then life happens. And we might wake up in a bad mood one day. Well, I can tell you if my husband's in a bad mood, I get affected by it because he's never in a bad mood. He always wakes up and is happy. He whistles through the house and he's just in a good old mood and sometimes it drives me insane. I go, do you ever have a bad day? You know, I mean, seriously. So, you know, Harry and Barbara's marriage had been on the rocks for years and they uh, found out that the church was gonna have a marriage seminar and so they decided that they were going to go. And the pastor stood up and he said, you know, men out, out here, there's so many men that are here. It, it indicates to me that your marriages are probably not going too good. And he goes, I just have to ask you men, because you're the head of the household, you kind of drive the forces of your marriage. I would like to know, does any of you know what your, uh, what your wife's favorite flower is? Does any of you just know that one thing? Harry whispered in Barbara's ear, and he says, well, he says, I, I think I know yours. He said, isn't it that gold medal all-purpose flower? <laughs> You'll get it. You'll process it. Are you processing it? Bill gets it because he knows what gold medal all-purpose flower is. <laughs> What kind of attitude do, uh, do you have here today? Are you constantly worried about what tomorrow's going to bring? Are you afraid that you're not going to have enough? When those thoughts of despair and hopelessness fill your mind up, do you sit down with a bowl of ice cream and entertain those hopeless thoughts in your head? Or do you go get your favorite blankie and go curl up in bed and have a good cry? Or do you go into the dark room and sit there and let those thoughts of negativity enter your mind and you make them roam over and over and feel sorry for yourself? Every dark thought that you entertain in your mind will cause you to slip farther and farther away from the one person that can make a difference and bring hope <coughs> in your life, and that is Jesus. Stop that! Don't do that. Do not do that. Lose that. Do not let those thoughts, those negative thoughts about yourself, about your life, about where you're going, don't let them park up in your mind. Now, there's a commercial on TV, and we've all seen it, and it's the Mucinex commercial, where the little blob of phlegm is in the lungs, and he pulls up his easy chair, and he's going to sit down in his easy chair and park in the guy's lungs, and then the man takes a cap full of Mucinex, and the, the little blob of, of mucus runs out. You've all seen it, right? We need to do that when, we're, when we get into a point where we have this blob of mucus going on up here in our minds. We need to think of that commercial, and here's what we need to do. We need to say, stop it. I am not thinking about that. I am the child of the Most High God. I am not going to think about those stinking, downtrodden, depressing, angry, hurtful, feel sorry for myself, thoughts. I am not. I am going to think on the most excellent things. I'm going to imagine something good about my life. I'm going to imagine the best job I can get. I'm going to imagine God leading me, giving me favor. These are the things that we should be thinking on. Luke 28 says, look up, rejoice, for your redemption draweth nigh. We must learn who God says that we are and quit thinking that we know because we don't. Ephesians 2.10 says this. Listen to me. For we are God's own handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, born new, that we may do those good works which God predestined for us that we should walk in them, living the good life, which he prearranged and made for us. So how did we get off course? If that's what he wants for us, the good life, how did we get off course? Why are we going through all of these things? Why? Why? 
The truth is he's always been with us. Many of where, why we're where we are is our own free will, our own choices. We got off course. But it's not too late when we begin to recognize the God within us. God is within us. And we learn, need to learn to say what he says about us. He will direct and fulfill our destiny. He will do the work. Our job is to trust him. That's what we need to do. Trust God, resist the enemy. Trust God, resist the enemy. Trust God. Take control of the thoughts in your mind, and he will help you fulfill that. We need to practice knowing. Practice knowing. Dare to believe. Practice knowing. Know that his word is true. Know that the word is true. If you don't believe what I'm saying, go read it for yourselves. The word is true. It will direct your steps. It will cause you to be free indeed. If you want to be free today, you want to be free from drugs and alcohol, you want to be free from the strongholds that are trying to destroy your life, if you want to be free today, you need to open that word up and start reading the recipe that God has designed for your life. It will work. It worked for me. It will work for you. But we need to practice knowing. Know. Know that he will never, ever leave you or forsake you. He is the God that loves you. He upholds you. You in the palm of his hand is where he sits you. Why? Because he loves you so much. He is he planted love in each one of our hearts. Why? Because that's where he lives. He is love. When we stop dwelling in our past, stop talking and proclaiming that junk over our lives, stop that thought. We can control the thoughts that we are thinking about. The scriptures tell us this. Take every thought, every thought, every thought captive. Take it captive. That means you can stop that, that wrong thinking, that stinking th thinking. You have power and control over that. Stop fantasizing about junk. Now, I used to do this too. I've kind of done all of this. I'd lay around in bed and fantasize about, God, I wonder what it would feel like if somebody just shot me. I wonder what people would think. I wonder what they would do. I wonder how that would be. Now, I know you're laughing at me, but I bet you a lot of you that you wouldn't stand up here and tell me what you think about. I would do that. Just stupid stuff. Just anything for attention. Even just to give myself a little attention. Think about negative. I wonder what my husband would do then if I just got shot. Not my husband now, but my husband. <laughs> yeah, then, he, well, how would he feel then? He wouldn't be treating me like this. Now, come on, we do stupid stuff. I've been there and done all of that stuff. I have. I hate to admit it, but I have. I don't do that anymore. We don't have to obsess over things like that. If you have obsessive thinking about yourself, about your life, uh, it has, you know, you say, oh, life has just be dealt me a bad hand. Mary, you just don't understand. Your, your life is great. Well, it might appear that it is today, and my life is pretty good today, but it didn't used to be. But it is pretty darn good today, I can say that. But I had to learn these principles, and I had to stop acting like a fool. And as long as you act like a fool, you're going to be a fool. If you don't want to be a fool anymore, then you need to learn a better way. It's possible to do these things. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee. You might have to resist those thoughts 50 times a day. I used to have to. Who cares? Do it. It works. Your past was over two minutes ago. Right now you're into your future. You have this moment right here today. Take hold of the new thing. Take hold of the new thing that God is trying to plant in your life. Do the new thing. Eat it like you would eat a chocolate chip cookie. Eat it. Devour it. Learn about it. You will. Now listen to me. I'm going to say a very <coughs> bold statement to you right now. You will never relapse again if you take control over your own mind and stop letting Satan have control over your thoughts. Amen. I guarantee it. Who said amen? You're right. Amen to that. Because that is the truth of the matter. 
You have heard this a hundred times. Relapse starts between your ears. If you will take control over that, I promise you, you will never, ever relapse again. Satan wants you to alter the state of your mind. He wants it. That's why there's drugs today. That's why Colorado stupidly legalized marijuana. They are stupid. Coloradians are stupid. <laughs> That's why they did. Satan entices men to do the wrong thing. He wants you to be, he wants your mind to be altered because if he can alter your mind, he can take your life. So most of you know, and we're going to end here, most of you know that I love to play golf. I love it. So when you go out on the golf course, you're on hole number one, you tee your ball up, and you try to hit it as far as you can. And so you chip up onto the green, and you know, on a par four, you're there in two. You have a chance for birdie. Just starting the day off. Oh gosh, it feels good. I'm, I'm breathing too. I'm gonna set my putt up. I'm gonna line my ball up. I'm gonna focus, and I take my putter and hit the ball, and it misses. Well, that's okay though, because I still can make a par, and that's okay. So I'll take a par. That's good, good way to start the day. So focus again. Get the putter lined up. Hit the ball. Miss again. Disappointed, but that's okay. I've lived with bogeys before. I can live with a bogey again. <laughs> Go for it again. Miss again. Double bogey, starting the whole day off. Double bogey. Now I have a chip. I have a choice. Hole number one is done, and now I'm moving on to hole number two. I can get an attitude to go, well, this is, this is just a great day. Ah, uh, man, this game today is just not, it's going to be in the trash. Or I can move on to hole number two and go, well, yeah, I didn't do good on hole number one, but I believe that hole number two is going to be great and the rest of the day. I'm going to have a good score anyway. Now, if I go to hole number two thinking that the day is in the trash, the day is going to be in the trash. If I change my attitude and go to hole number two and think that, well, it's all right, I bet I can still do good. Typically speaking, you'll still do good. What are you focusing on today? What are you focusing on? Are you going to shake off the bad and put on the new? Or are you just going to keep focusing on the bad? Because if you do, you're calling things that are not as though they were. You want bad things to come to you? You keep doing that. You want to change your life? You need to change your thinking. You need to take control of your mind. Take control over your thoughts and quit letting Satan steal your joy. You need to go through life saying, listen to me, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it because this is the day the Lord has made. He will never leave me. He will never, ever forsake me. 1 Peter 2.6 says this, He who believes in Him, who adheres to, adhere, adhere like, like super glue. You put super glue on something, put something else up to it, it adheres to it. It adheres to it. He who believes in Him, who adheres to, Trust in, you need to trust in and rely on Him, shall never, never, never be disappointed or put to shame. That's one you should memorize. 1 Peter 2, 6. Now come on, I want you to change your thinking. I want you to know that you are the apple of God's eye. He loves you. He careth for you, Hannah. He careth for you. He is going to raise you up, and He is going to build you up, and He is going to change your life once and for all. What is your part? Change your thinking, and do what else? Resist the enemy. Resist. That's your part. Make your choice. Do it today. We have a beautiful 
mid-April snowy day. It's beautiful outside. Thank God for Colorado weather. Thursday it was 70 degrees out. Today we have a blizzard. But thank you for coming out. You braved the weather. I'm proud of you. You had a message today that if you will walk out of here and not let Satan steal the word out of your heart, you, it's going to be rooted and grounded in you, and you will take root in what I said today from God, and you are going to change your life. Who has a prayer request? <coughs> James. Um, just for my mother and housemates and the people at NBRC, all the people that are threatened and disappointed with my relapse last week. Okay. But you've changed. Yep. Thank you. Yes. I have two of my immediate family in addition. Okay. Just pray for them to open their hearts to the Lord and get help. Okay. Sick the Holy Spirit on them. I sure will. Yes. <laughs> it's not a prayer request, but it kind of went along with something that I heard that mm -hmm. went along with what you said today. And it was uh, this motivational speaker I, I talk to quite often. And he said, you know, the biggest enemy you have to deal with is yourself. Mm -hmm. And he said, if, and it's, in, it's a proverb in the Bible that says that there's no enemy within the outside enemy you may do us no harm. So if you focus on yourself, you walk with God and don't let Satan take over, you can handle any obstacle that comes throughout your day. Amen. I like that. That's awesome. Prayer request. <coughs> James. I would like to continue to pray over my sister. She's still grieving, you know what I mean? Yeah. my sister prayer with you, please. And our prayers and hearts go out to you and your family. It affects the whole family. Yeah. Anybody else? Gosh, everybody's good today? No. <laughs> yes, Bill. Uh, for Arthur and Daniel, uh, they're both relapsed. Okay. And we continue to lift Linda up as well. Yes. I would like to ask a prayer for all of us here in New York City in the program here because without his strength came none of us make it. You know what I mean? And I, I right. believe that prayer can accomplish what we can. Okay. Well, um, I've just been impressed. James, why don't you come on up here and I would like you to pray over us today with that word. <laughs> oh, see, you gotta be careful. <laughs> oh, you're good, Mary. Well, you know what? Every person needs to to stand prepared. We need to we need to look how big he is. <laughs> With a big prayer. Yeah, big prayer. You know, we need to stand prepared. You don't know that you won't be at the bus stop and somebody will be there that is hurting. And when you have the gift of discernment in your spirit, you might ask that person, can I pray with you? I know that we had a situation with Monica one time where she was, I think, at a bus stop and a lady there was hurting and, and she told her about Mary's hope and voila you know she helped the woman we need to be prepared to do these things don't just walk around with your dark glasses on and blinders <coughs> over your eyes and think that life is just all about you because you're kind of stuck in the mud don't do that each person in here needs to be watchful of your surroundings who's around you be watchful and be watchful that Satan doesn't try to deceive you. We need to cautiously be watching all the time for that. All right? Last call for prayer request. Yes. I just want to uh, say some prayer for when we're having our successes, too, because we get we let our guard down. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to watch over us in our successes as well as failures. But. <laughs> That's true, you know. And when you say that, it just brings me to mind that Sometimes we get so focused on some of the folks that are struggling that we forget about the ones that have got huge success. Yeah. Like little Jessica back there. She's got huge success. She's just got a promotion at her job. She came as a graduate from New Beginnings Recovery Center. She's been clean and sober for over a year. She's a success. And people go, yeah, but there's lots of relapses. Yes, but there's also lots of success. I look at David Tappy has been with Mary's Hope how many years? Uh, it'll be five in May. Five years? Yeah. Clean and sober? House coordinator? You know? 
Now, his, his, some of the residents that lives with him thinks, you know, that he's mean, but he's successful. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We got, we have another Steve over here who's been with Mary's Hope. How many, how long? February three years. Three years? Clean, sober, never missed a beat, works hard, house coordinator. So he's a success. There's many in this room that are successes. Billy is a, a success back there. Tim has been with us for many years, and he's never missed a beat, ever. You know, these are people to follow in their footsteps because they're successful. You may not like everything they do, but you don't like everything I do. So, you know, James. I just want to say James is an amazing house coordinator and well, good. All my stuff, he always had a little positive thing to say and helped guide me even when I was miserable. Oh, well, good. So, well, well there you go. Billy. I'd like to pray for one individual that needs, I wish they would be here to hear this uh, scripture, that needs to change their way of thinking and their attitude. Okay. And they're not here right now. Oh, well, they can watch it online. <laughs> Chris videos these each week and puts them online, so if you wish you'd had more of my voice, <laughs> you can watch it online. All right, let's stand and pray. Lord, I Father, we come before you grateful, humbly, asking that you continue to serve us and build our hearts to repair those hurts, those ills, those shortcomings which we all too often seem to let tear us down. We ask that you would help us to stay strong against the enemy and his attacks, for he is worn around like a roaming lion seeking whom he may devour. We ask that you would continue to be a blessing to Mary's Hope, to NDRC, that you would bless those people who so care, who so effortlessly, who so, I mean, graciously give of their kindness and their love to us we need it. We ask that you watch over Mary, over Chris, over all the staff in the RC. We also ask that you watch over all the, all the people in the houses and that you would just help us to stay strong, to keep strong in the face of adversity, um, to muster up the strength to change, and to most of all, come to you in prayer, for we know that prayer moves now, so that we can accomplish more through prayer than we can ever accomplish in our own, faith, our own strength. So we ask you these things and ask you to allow us to have a good day, Father God, on purpose, in Jesus' name.
I'll come out as soon as I'm done. I'll just keep it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh,
Oh, did you? Oh, oh well, thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. Tonight at 5 30. I'm here. And then, yeah, I get off at 6. Let me carry you. Yeah. Alright, Chris, I'll see you, Bill. Right. Take care. I'll see you, Bill. Yeah. See you, Anthony. See you, Bill. See you, Bill. All right, man. I'll see you in a little bit. See you. I'll be back. All right. Thank you. 